Johnny Dollar. Ed Barringer, Continental Insurance and Trust. Well, nice to hear from you, Ed. It's been a long time since Johnny, you called Johnny, listen. Me. Yeah? I've already telephoned the airport, made a reservation. Well, good for you. Have a happy trip. No, Johnny. No, that reservation's for you. It's on the next flight down to New York. For me? What for? So hop into your car and get on out to the airport just as fast as you can. You've only got a few minutes to make that Whoa, plane. hold on. Wait a minute. I'll meet you there at Bradley Field, give you the address of the man in New York and all the details. Yeah, what man? His name is Lucian Ar... Look, Johnny, there isn't time. Get on out there to the airport. Yeah, you look. Unless I know why you want me to get down and see this Lucian, whatever his name is. Well? Sure, I'll tell you why. Well? Johnny, it's to prevent a murder. Oh? CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance and Trust Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the the back-to-the-back matter. The gas tank of my car was dry as a bone, so expense account item one is 5.30 to fill it up. Then I tore on out to Bradley Field, and sure enough, Ed Berenger was waiting for me. Oh, yeah. Is this plane over here? Hi, Ed. How are you? Here now. Here's your ticket. Okay. And here's Mr. Fletcher's address down in New York. Fletcher? Lucian R. Fletcher, head of the Fletcher Advertising Agency. Oh, wants to buy some commercial time on my radio show? No. Well, he better talk to the folks at CBS. No, Johnny, listen. Oh, yeah, that's right. You mentioned that nasty word, murder. He phoned me just before I called you. That, uh, That agency of his is a small one, but prosperous. Up until a couple of years ago, when he took on a partner, it was practically a one-man operation. So? This partner's name is William Spade, Bill Spade. And what Fletcher called about was to tell me that Spade is out to murder him. Why? To get his hands on the advertising agency. What else? So jump onto that no, plane. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Ed. If Fletcher knows this, if he's sure of it... He's sure of it, all right. So, Johnny... Well, look, then why doesn't he call in the police? Have this guy, Spade, locked up? Spade is out of town on some business down in Philadelphia, but he's due back sometime today. There in New York. Now, you? Ed, look, Johnny, I... old man Fletcher isn't the kind to go off half cocked to come up with a false alarm. So go on down there, find out exactly what's up, do whatever's necessary to nail down his partner, and. Well, go on, Johnny. Your plane's about ready for takeoff. Okay, okay, as long as you're paying the freight. But now listen. Johnny, you haven't any time. Oh, I'll make it all right. Relax. Listen, as soon as we take off, you telephone Lieutenant Randy Singer. Sure, sure, sure. New York Police Department, 18th Precinct, Homicide Division. Yeah, okay. Tell him what you just told me, and then I'm on my way. Sure, sure. Now get aboard before you're too late. Sure. Item two on the expense account is, uh, well, no. The ticket for the flight was already paid for, and, of course, I'd hate to be accused of padding the old expense account. Or should I say getting caught... So, item two is a dime for a phone call as soon as I landed there in New York. And not to Mr. Fletcher's address at 614 East 52nd Street. 18th Precinct. Conroy. Yeah, Conroy, this is Johnny Dollar. Let me talk to Lieutenant Singer. Oh, hiya, Dollar. How's the private eye business these days? Special investigator to you, copper. (laughs) Don't like being called a private eye, huh? What's your guess? And listen, us cops don't like being called cops anymore. Yeah, so I've heard. But haven't you heard, Conroy, that a rose by any other name? Now, what's that mean? Well, you figure that one out. Now, will you switch me over to Randy Singer? Afraid I can't do that. What? The lieutenant pulled out of here about 20 minutes ago in one of the squad cars. Oh. Uh, Big emergency or something like, aren't they all? But uh, he'll be back. Well, look, do you know if he got a call from up in Hartford, Connecticut a while ago? No, uh, not that I know of. But I only come on duty about half an hour ago. Okay. But I know he made a lot of frantic phone calls before he took off, if that means anything. Well, does it? Also, he took the medico along with him. Ah. Well, listen, Conroy, when he comes in, tell him I'll be over at 614 East 52nd Street. 614? At the apartment of a Mr. Lucian R. Fletcher. Now, Dollar, you... Tell him if he can make it, I want to see him over there. 614 East 52nd Street. Yeah, that's right. Now, listen. Gotta go now. Item three is 640 for a taxi into 614. 
For some silly reason or other, the doorman at that snooty address hesitated about steering me out to Mr. Fletcher's apartment. That is, until I flashed my credentials at him and mumbled the magic word, emergency. Then I took the elevator up to the ninth floor. Come in, Johnny. Come on in. Huh? Conroy phoned me. You're on your way over here. How are you, boy? Randy. Oh, and Ed Barron's here up in Hartford did call you. Yeah, that's right. So I came on over here to see Mr. Fletcher, find out what all the excitement was about. Well, what'd you find out? Now, why don't you just come on into the library and see for yourself? Sure, sure. Well, but if you ask me, Randy, see... Huh? Yeah. This... Mr. Fletcher? That's Mr. Fletcher. Dead. That's right, Johnny. Dead as a doornail. Who'd you vote for in the last general election? You may not realize it, but you voted for someone you probably never heard of and whose name may not have appeared on your ballot. And who was this stranger? He was the elector appointed by your state to decide who was to be our president. Every state has as many electors as it has representatives and senators in Congress combined. Collectively, they're called the Electoral College. And it's the members of the Electoral College alone who can vote for the president of the United States. Your vote was cast for the group of electors that pledged itself to vote for either the Democratic or Republican nominee. But you did not vote directly for either candidate. A roundabout way of doing things? Yes. But you must remember that when the Constitution was written, there was no television, no radio, and few newspapers. The majority of voters had never traveled more than a few miles from their own homes. In these circumstances, it was impossible for a voter in Maine to know about the great public figures of New York or Pennsylvania, Virginia, or South Carolina. There were not even any political parties to guide him. And so the voter in Maine didn't try to do the impossible. He voted for someone who did know the great men of the times and who could render an intelligent decision as to which one of them should make the best president. The system has its faults. Three times in our history, the man who got the most votes from the people was not elected president because he did not get the most votes in the Electoral College. Yet no one today seriously proposes to abolish the Electoral College because, by and large, the people believe that, in spite of its drawbacks, the present system of electing our president ensures that your country and mine shall be our country under God. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny, somebody came in here and finished him off with just exactly one nice, clean shot through the heart. Uh-huh. Any sign of a struggle, Randy? Anything like that? No, sir. So it must have been somebody that he knew that let him in here himself. Yeah, well, I'll buy that all right. And it kind of proves the old man was right in his fears after all. Huh? When, Randy? Any idea when Mr. Fletcher was murdered? Well, I got that call from your insurance agent up in Hartford early this morning. I tried calling Mr. Fletcher at his office, but uh, he told me he hadn't come in yet. Yeah? So I tried calling him here. No answer. So I grabbed Doc Snyder, and he was sure that Fletcher hadn't left the place. Well, I borrowed the key, and the Doc and I came up here. Randy, you haven't answered my question. Oh, according to the Doc, it happened sometime very early this morning, uh, right after midnight. Uh Uh-huh, I see. Doc and a couple of boys from the lab just left. Uh Oh, they find anything, Randy? Any clues? Eh, not a thing to work on. All they know is that he was shot through the heart and what he was shot with. And believe me, Johnny, that bullet was placed just exactly right. Well, now, what do you mean by that? Well, just take a good look at it right there. Well, now, what under the sun is that? Some kind of a bulletproof vest? Yeah, that's what I thought until Doc Snyder looked at it. No, Johnny, it's a, it's a kind of a corset. Corset? Yeah, that's right. A, a kind of a back support that was made for him especially. Oh. Uh, on account of some kind of sacred, I mean, uh, sacro 
Lumber trouble or something. Oh, yeah, sacral lumbar support. Yeah, that's it. I've never seen one quite like this. This thing's almost like a suit of armor. Sure. That's why I say it was a lucky shot. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the shot had to be placed exactly right. Inch or two on either side, and one of those wide steel ribs would have bounced it off. Yeah. Or at least kept it from going straight into his heart. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. A thirty-eight slug pack's a lot of wallop. It... Yeah, only this was a little twenty-two. Uh, but now, listen. Yeah? That insurance man, the one who called and said you were coming on down here? Ed Berenger. Yeah. Well, he told me that Fletcher had been expecting something like this. That's right, right. Yeah, he said that Fletcher made no bones about who might try. That's right. The one man who might stand to benefit from his insurance. And somehow we have to find him. Yeah, well, who's that? Randy, in his advertising business, he had a partner. Uh -huh. And it seems this partner, a man named William Spade... Oh, wait a minute. That's probably the boys with the meat wagon. And come on to pick him up. Okay, I'll let him in. Okay, boys, you can come. I, huh? I beg your pardon? Who are you? Why, my name's Spade, Bill Spade. I'm Mr. Fletcher's partner. What's that? So you're Bill Spade, huh? Yes. Well, my name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. The insurance investigator? That's right. And is that a policeman I see in there in the library? Mr. Dollar, is something wrong here? Where have you been, Mr. Spade? Why, I just got in from Philadelphia. I was down there on some important agency business. Just but got now back, what? huh? When? Well, my plane got in about uh, half an hour ago, maybe 45 minutes. Well, here. Here's my ticket. You can check on it. Yeah, maybe I will. Where did you stay in Philadelphia? Uh, at the Bellevue Stratford. But why? What's wrong around here? Where is Mr. Fletcher? Just take it easy, Mr. Spade. But I've got to see him on a business matter. You do, huh? Yes, it's very important about a new client of ours. It has to be acted on at once. Well, I'm afraid it's going to have to wait. Well, I called the office from the airport, and they said he wasn't in yet, so I came on over here. Now, where is he, and what's this all about, Mr. Dollar? So, you claim you were down in Philadelphia when your business partner was shot. That's right, I was... Shot? Mr. Fletcher was shot? Real surprised. Where is he? Let me see him. I said take it easy. But good heavens, Mr. Take Dollar. Take it easy, and if this business matter is so all-fired important, well, hadn't you better be down at the office taking care of it? Now, Johnny... Well, Mr. Spade? Well, yes, of course. Of course I should. Sure, sure you should. So, uh, why don't you just run along? Oh, wait. Uh, after all, Mr. Fletcher's in no condition to run your ad agency. Well, that's the understatement but I, of all I, time. I can't right? believe it. Mr. Fletcher... Did. Oh, you can't, huh? This is terrible. Uh, have you any idea who could have done this to him? Are you kidding? What do you mean? All right, now, Spade. Yeah, Mr. Spade, you'd better get on down to that office of yours. Huh? And as soon as we can tell you anything, we will get in touch. Uh, believe, believe me, no, no, believe me if no. there's anything I can do, please call oh, on now, just don't you worry about that. But get on down to the office and take over. No, wait, right ahead, Mr. No, Spade. I'll be in touch with you. Very well, Mr. Dollar. Now, what are you... What's got into you, Johnny? You're the one just got through telling me he's the one that must have killed Mr. Fletcher. So how are you going to prove it? Well, we got no other suspect, have we? Uh, and you let him go. Look here, this plane ticket. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. I saw him shove it into your hand. I knew that Spade was supposed to be in Philly, that he was due to come back here today, so when I pulled into the airport, I carefully checked the incoming flight schedule. <laughs> so what? Oh, this flight was due in all right, and from Philadelphia... Just what he said, half or three-quarters of an hour ago. Yeah, all right, all right. So what? That doesn't prove he was actually on that flight. Randy, I think he was. That ticket could have been used by somebody else. Well, it's easy enough to check on, but I doubt it very much. All right, but if you're right about that, if he was down there in Philly, then your first theory about him is all wrong. How could he have murdered Mr. Fletcher? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Of course, it is. Want to bet? He looks just like his father. We've all heard statements like this. But have you ever stopped to wonder exactly why we resemble our relatives? One man did, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Born in Lexington, Kentucky in 1866, Morgan's interest in science took him to the University of Kentucky and Johns Hopkins. While his colleagues were choosing fields in physics and chemistry, Morgan's interest turned to something more personal, man himself. Why do we inherit physical characteristics from our parents? To find the answer, Morgan spent years studying the common fruit fly. 
He bred generation after generation, constantly observing the traits produced. He then computed mathematical tables and analyzed the whole question of heredity in terms of the nucleus. The nucleus, he observed, was the center of activity in every cell. As a result, he developed his theory of the gene. This theory, simplified, holds that each human cell contains hundreds of units called genes and each gene carries a physical characteristic from its parents. For this outstanding work, Morgan was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1933. Thomas Hunt Morgan, an American scientist with the philosophy that somewhere there must be an answer. Let's find it. Now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Back to the... Expense account item four, ten cents for a call to the Fletcher Advertising Agency. No, sir. Mr. Spade isn't in yet. All right, then, miss. He telephoned that he would stop off and see Mr. Fletcher before coming in at Mr. Fletcher's apartment. And he called you from the airport, didn't he? Yes, sir. And uh, probably left the door of the phone booth open so you could hear the background noise of the planes and so on. What? Sure. So you know he actually was calling from the airport. Item five, 60 cents for half a dozen calls to various departments of the airline company. And finally, I managed to get hold of the gal who'd been stewardess on the flight in from Philadelphia. Yes, a uh, kind of light sandy hair and blue eyes. Uh-huh. And he wore a uh, dark brown tweed suit. Oh, and his briefcase had the initials W.S. on it. Yeah, then it must have been Bill Spade, all right. But uh, how come you remembered him so well out of your whole list of passengers? Oh, could I forget him? What do you mean by that? Oh, Mr. Dollar, from takeoff to landing, that whole flight was perfect. But Mr. William Spade insisted he was airsick, or on the verge of it. Oh? Uh-huh. He must have pushed the call button a dozen times. Mary and I were busier with him than with all the other passengers put together. Oh, I see. Mary swore he was perfectly all right. That didn't keep him from pushing that button. Yeah, almost as though he was deliberately calling attention to himself. Yes certainly look that way. But why? I think I have a pretty good idea. Thanks a lot. Spade told me he'd stayed over in Philadelphia at the Bellevue Stratford. Item six is a dollar thirty for a call down there. Well, that's right, sir. Uh, Mr. Spade got his key from me and went up to his room at about oh, 10 o'clock last night. Uh, you mean he said he was going to his room? That's right. Then he checked out about uh, 8 o'clock this morning. I see. If it uh, means anything, he mentioned the importance of catching a plane to New York. He mentioned it several times to both me and the cashier. I'm sure he did. All, uh, almost like a kid about to take his first airplane ride. Oh, uh, maybe it was just to impress you with the time he left your hotel. Oh? Well, what do you mean by that, sir? Nothing. Forget it. Thanks. <laughs> From the minute Spade handed me that plane ticket as an alibi, I felt sure he had murdered Mr. Fletcher. As for all his trouble to establish he'd been in Philadelphia that morning, then aboard the plane, then at the airport, well, all very clever. But where was he? What was he doing before he checked under the Bellevue? And don't forget, it's only a short hop from Philly to New York. Oh, I knew what Spade's answer would be, that he was in his hotel room asleep, and I'm sure that no one could prove otherwise. No one, that is, except Spade himself, could prove he left that hotel during the night, gone to New York under another name, killed his partner, then got back in plenty of time to check out of the Bellevue at 8 a.m. So unless I could somehow, somehow trick him. Item 785 cents for a cab to his office. Yes, come in, Mr. Dollar, and sit down. Ah, all right, thanks. I'm sorry for the appearance of my desk, but with all that's happened and with the affairs of my new client to take care of... Your new client? Well, after all, with Mr. Fletcher gone... Hmm. Hey, it looks to me like you have every newspaper in town piled up here. But they wouldn't write about Mr. Fletcher unless he were dead or murdered. What? Tell me, how did you and Fletcher get along? I suppose I might have expected you to ask something like that, just as a matter of routine questioning. Your questioning of anyone who knew him. Maybe. But what did you mean by saying the papers would only print a story if he were dead? Just let me ask the question, sir. Well, of course. Well? 
Mr. Fletcher and I ran this business together. Personally, how'd you get along? He was a very difficult person, Mr. Dollar. Created many embarrassing situations here in the office. Embarrassing for you? Yes. But I blame it all on the constant pain from his back. You see, he had a very serious condition, a sacral lumbar Yes, trouble. I know, I know that. But I had to admire and respect him. He was a genius. Now, just look at the way he built up this agency. Yeah. Be nice to have, wouldn't it? Especially by you. In other words, you had plenty of motive for killing him. Yes, of course. But if you think for one minute... And I'm I... sure you had no trouble getting hold of a key to his apartment. Mr. Dollar... Who knows? Maybe Mr. Fletcher gave you one. After all, his own partner... Dollar, if this is he... an attempt to be facetious... Look here, it's bad enough that Mr. Fletcher is dead. Now, that's the second time you've said that. Said what? That Fletcher is dead. Well, of course I... What? Did I say that he was? Or the lieutenant there at the apartment? You said he was shot. He, he must be dead. You mentioned his back trouble. Look here now. Is... I myself saw that corset he was wearing, those wide, heavy stays made of steel. Oh, you... you Why, mean... it would bounce off it like hail off a roof. No, a big gun, a thirty-eight. But you forgot all about that regular suit of armor he had around him. But he fell. I, I saw him. I saw him fall. Sure you did. And I thought the bullet... But if I didn't kill him, I, I was sure I had. I'd, a... I'd aim for his heart, and when he fell... When he... Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. Fletcher is dead. And now that you've told me who did it... Dollar, please... Listen. You, uh, mind if I use your phone? Ah, it's funny how a man like that can plan a thing so carefully, carry it out so carefully, and then when he's caught, lose his head and blab all over the place. <laughs> Spade even made a grab for the little twenty-two pistol he'd used and had right there on his desk. Well, it'll be good as evidence. Expense account total, including a good meal and the fare back to dear old Hartford. Hmm. Twenty-five eighty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Frank Gerstel, James McCallion, Herb Vigran, Jack Edwards, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>